So this is Mary's reaction to her vocation. We can think about what was going through her mind as she was singing this beautiful hymn. She's full of thanksgiving. She's full of joy for what's just happened in her life. Jesus has come into her life. She even knows his name at this point. The angel's even told her his name. She's thanking Jesus in her womb already for this most amazing gift. And she's full of thanksgiving. One of the prayers that we say at Mass, every Mass, is it is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Always and everywhere to give you thanks. And it's only really Mary who can give thanks always and everywhere. The rest of us, even St. Joseph and the rest, we can't do it always and everywhere. Sometimes it's not thanksgiving that comes from our mouth, but it's complaint. Sometimes we don't accept the will of God in our lives. But Mary, it's always and everywhere. She's just full of thanksgiving. And you might say, well, of course, you know, she's been given this most beautiful news. Why not? Why wouldn't she give thanks? But we can also think a bit more about what was going through her mind. What will Joseph think? What will Joseph think when he finds out? What will her parents think? What will her friends think? It's not uh, an un unalloyed joy. There's lots of questions that it throws up. And one of these questions is a really serious one, that when Mary said yes to Jesus coming into her life, she's taking a big risk, a huge risk, which sometimes we don't see. But if we go to another part of the Gospel, it helps us understand this amazing risk that Mary's taking. There's a scene where an adulterous woman is brought before Jesus, and the Jews are saying to him, um, you know, what shall we do with her? You know, because in the law of Moses, we should stone her. And they're trying to test Jesus, what's he going to say? Because that was the law of Moses. You know, an adulterous woman could have been stoned. And okay, you might say, well, but the Jews, they didn't have the power to execute anyone. That's why they had to take Jesus to the Romans. So they wouldn't have really killed anyone for that. But they stoned Stephen. The Jews stoned Stephen a few years later. So why not Mary? Mary was taking a huge risk when she said yes, and she knew it. She was putting her life on the line to let Jesus into her life. And yet, in the midst of that, when she doesn't know how Joseph's going to react, she doesn't know about the angel coming to him, she starts saying thank you. In that moment, she starts seeing this hymn of thanks with all of those doubts, all of those worries, all of those problems, and she says, thank you. Always and everywhere to give you thanks. Thank you. Even though she couldn't see how it was going to work out. Thank you. She could just see the problems. Thank you. And do we say thank you for our worries. I don't know about you, but I remember my grandmother used to say, oh, offer it up, you know, if you stub your toe or whatever it is. And that's amazing advice. But the thing I always find hardest to offer up are my worries. The things we don't have control of, the things that are slightly nebulous and fuzzy and we don't know how it's going to work out. But Mary, has all of these things in her mind. And she says, thank you. She says, my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. She's full of joy because she trusts. She knows that even if she can't work it out, God will. My spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. He has done great things for me. Huge things. He's done great things for me, Mary says, and he's done great things for each of us. 
And that last person mentioned in that hymn of thanks can really help us understand Mary even more. She mentions Abraham right at the end. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his posterity forever. Abraham is a great figure of faith. Do you remember that story when he's asked to sacrifice his son? He puts wood on his son's shoulders and they go up a hill and he takes a knife and he's about to do it. He's got so much faith in God that he's willing to even raise the knife because he knows God will intervene in some way. And so Abraham is this huge figure of faith. But Mary has even more faith than Abraham. Mary's son had wood put on his shoulders. Mary's son went up a hill. Mary stood next to him, but the knife, the blade, didn't stop with Jesus. His side was pierced. And we hear that, that prophecy of a sword will pierce your soul, Mary. That pain of seeing her son die. And yet even in that, she trusted. Even in that moment, she trusted that God's will would be done. And she believed. Mary is this huge figure of faith. And she can say, because of her faith, thank you for everything for her worries, for her problems, for her sorrows. Thank you, because even if they're not good in themselves, she trusts that God will bring good from them. And in this scene as well, after that mention of Abraham, she spends three months with Elizabeth. And again, we can think of those moments. Imagine that household. It wasn't a very happy household. You've got Zechariah who's been struck down because he hasn't believed in the angel. Um, Mary's having to help out with all sorts of things. She's probably not feeling great. She's just started her pregnancy. And it's in these little things that that hymn is echoing in her mind. Thank you, my soul magnifies the Lord. And so we can have that ringing in our ears. Thank you. Even in those little daily duties, those family situations. Thank you for everything, the big and the small. And the very word, thank you, helps us understand the mass. Eucharist, that word Eucharist means thank you. That's the very meaning of the word. And so we can bring to the mass everything and say thank you. And especially thank you for Jesus at Holy Communion. In December, I went to a retreat day for priests, and there was a very good bishop who gave a talk, and he quoted this wonderful author, and she was thinking about Holy Communion and, and Mary, and she said that Mary, Jesus was so close to Mary in her womb, that amazing bond with Jesus when he was in her womb. But then she says, she's called Carol Houselander, for those of you who are interested. She said, but when we receive Jesus in Holy Communion, He's even closer to us than he was to Mary then. That's how deeply he comes to us and how deeply we can say thank you with Mary in those moments. Mary says thank you, but she is no shrinking violet. She asks for big things. She's very frank and sincere. And we see that in the next passage, she makes demands of Jesus. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. They have no wine. What a wonderful way to ask Jesus for something. Not, if you want, Lord, you might give us. They have no wine. Do something about it. They have no wine. Mary makes demands of Jesus. And that's music to his ears. 
Jesus loves it when we make demands of him, when we really ask him for things. And the problem isn't that we ask for too much, it's usually we ask for too little, or we don't even ask at all. St. James has a letter in the New Testament, and it's possible that St. James was related to Mary, he's called the, one of the cousins of Jesus in the scriptures, and he seems to share this frankness of Mary. If you read the letter of St. James, he's very frank, very emphatic. And he talks about this idea of Jesus, when Jesus says, ask and you will receive. And he says, the problem is, and I'll just paraphrase, he says the problem is, often we don't even ask. It seems too good to be true, we don't even ask. Jesus says, ask and you shall receive, and we don't even ask. Perhaps there's many things we don't ask Jesus for, we just try and sort them out ourselves. And then James says, well, sometimes we ask, but sometimes we ask for the wrong thing. We ask for something just for ourselves, in a narrow way. And even if we do ask, and if we do ask for the right thing, often we ask without faith. We doubt, we hesitate. Whereas Mary, she does all those three things. She asks. And she asks for the right thing, which is usually asking to help others. And she asks with total faith. In fact, she's not put off by what Jesus says. Jesus' reply isn't the most encouraging here. O oh woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. We might be put off if we heard that. But Mary has total faith. She acts as if it's going to happen. She trusts completely that Jesus will do it, and so she goes to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. It's as if Jesus has told her to go to the servants and tell them what to do. He hasn't said that. He said something a lot less clear. But Mary trusts, and so she acts as if it's going to happen. She has that total faith, and she asks. And we can ask ourselves, what have I stopped asking for? Or who have I stopped praying for? I know there's people in my life I used to pray for a lot, but then we kind of forget about them. Or they drift out of our minds. Or things we really need, but maybe because we don't get them as soon as we want them, we stop praying for them. What have I stopped praying for? Who have I stopped praying for? We have this nice music in our company. And sometimes we can think those people we've stopped praying for, maybe it's because we've had an argument with them, maybe we just don't believe it'll work out. And so Mary can really encourage us. She really asks. And she really asks with faith. She really believes that God can sort out whatever situation it is. She's not afraid to ask. And so she can really help us to ask as well. And she knows that Jesus loves it when we ask him for things. The bigger the better. In this moment in the Gospel, it lets Jesus show his glory to his disciples. And so Mary can encourage us to really ask. And the privileged time, the best time to ask, is in the Mass. We have the bidding prayers in the Mass, but also we can come to Mass with all of our own intentions, all of the things really we really want, bring to the Mass all the people that we really want to help, we want Jesus to touch. That's the greatest time to ask in the Mass, and Mary can help us. In this scene, we see that Jesus calls Mary woman. And it's not an insult, it sounds a bit rude in English, but it's not, it's a dignified way of referring to her. And it points us ahead to the next time he calls her woman, which is at the cross. It says, woman, behold your son, speaking of John. And that moment, at that moment too, Mary was asking for things from Jesus. 
she was asking for John. She was praying for John, her new son. She was praying for all of her new children. She was praying for us. But she was also asking for herself at the cross. She was praying for herself. Because at the cross, we see that Mary was in a moment of temptation. That's our next section to think about. And just before I read that text, uh, we could just think about that for a minute. That sometimes we think of Mary uh, and her sinlessness that she never sinned, and we might think, well, she had an easy ride. Well, it's pretty easy for her. She never sinned, and so she's on a different planet to us. Um, Mary, with that singular grace to be conceived without sin, well, therefore, it's pretty easy, wasn't it, for her? But one way of getting into Mary, knowing who she really was and what her life was really like, is to realise how much she struggled against temptation. Mary is often seen as the new Eve. That's often the way she's presented. And that word type, that title she's given, woman, reminds us of the first time that word is used in the Bible of Genesis and it refers to Eve. And there's many other parallels which are mentioned in passing. But Mary is often understood as the new Eve. Well, Eve was conceived without sin. Eve was immaculately conceived. And yet Eve did sin. Eve was tempted and she sinned. And so Mary, she was conceived without sin, but she could have sinned. She wasn't immune from sin just because she'd started her life without it. She was tempted. And we see at the cross that Mary was tempted to lose her faith, to lose her trust in God. If we think of Eve, Eve stood by a tree and she was tempted to disobey God, tempted to lose her trust in God by that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Mary stands by a tree and she's tempted to lose her trust in God, the tree of the cross. Eve wanted to take that fruit down from the tree. And think how much Mary wanted to take Jesus down from the tree. Imagine her heart, seeing her son there on the cross, suffering so much. Imagine how much she wanted to take him down from the cross. She would have given anything to stop him suffering. And yet she knew that that wasn't God's will. She knew that she had to leave him there. She had to trust God and overcome that temptation to want to take him down. That's what they were shouting at Jesus. They were abusing him. They were saying, if you are the king of the Jews, come down from the cross. And Jesus resisted that temptation. And so did Mary. She knew that she had to leave Jesus there. That was God's will. She had to trust. But how tempted she was. How tempted she was to rebel against God's plan for her. As Eve did. And we can think, well, Mary was tempted, yes. But not tempted like us. Yes, maybe we might accept that Mary was tempted. We might think, well, yes, but, but we're different. You know, we're... We're tempted much more than she ever was because she never gave in. But if anything, she was tempted not less than us, but more than us. She experienced temptation much more than we ever will, precisely because she never gave in. There's an author, a wonderful American author called Scott Hahn, and he illustrates this with a comparison. Um, he talks about, well, his example is from the Second World War, but you can just think of any war, really. And he, he thinks of Belgium. You know, imagine how quickly Belgium.
Belgium was overcome by the Germans in the war, as the example he gives. But then imagine how, what a fight it was with Russia. You know, the battle with Russia just went on and on and on and on, because the Russians never gave up. And he says, well, we're like Belgium. You know, we don't put up much of a fight against temptation, and so it's over pretty quickly. But Mary, she's like Russia. She's the one who never gives up. She fights and fights and fights. She struggles and struggles and struggles out of love. And she resists. Mary's experience of temptation was much stronger than ours. And out of her love, she struggles. And so she can really help us to struggle if we are in temptation, if we feel like rebelling against God's plan for our lives. And she wasn't just tempted on the cross. She was tempted throughout her life. I'll now read this passage from the bottom of the sheet. And this is a text from the book of the Apocalypse. And in that book, there's a very symbolic image of a woman who is clothed with the sun, and she gives birth to a child, and a dragon comes to eat the child. But the child manages to escape, and then so does the woman. And this is poetry. It's a symbol. A symbol, first of all, of the church, but also, in another way, a symbol of Mary. And so we can think in symbolic terms that this woman represents Mary. And so I'd just like to read what happens next to this woman. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had borne the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river which the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon was angry with the woman, and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God, and bear testimony to Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And so this, in the symbolic language of this book, that dragon represents Satan also referred to as the serpent, reminding us of Genesis. And I said this woman represents the church, but also Mary. And this can help us understand Mary's, the rest of Mary's life too. That just as this dragon was constantly pursuing the woman, the devil was constantly pursuing Mary. Right up to the end of her life. She was constantly experiencing temptation. We can imagine Mary after the Ascension, and we see how briefly she's praying with the disciples, uh, with the, the church gathered together. And we don't really know what happens to her next. We know that uh, there's a tradition that she lives with John, and perhaps goes to Ephesus. But we do know that she had to keep up that battle against temptation right to the end of her life. Even though she never sinned, it wasn't easy. She couldn't slacken, she couldn't get lazy or selfish in her daily duties. She couldn't lack charity in her thoughts or her words, she couldn't complain. And she did it, she did it out of love. She struggled for Jesus out of love. But we can also realise that she needed help to do that. And there's a great tradition, certainly in art, it's often shown of Mary receiving the Eucharist in those days of her life, going on to her assumption that Mary needed the Eucharist to be faithful. And so Mary can help us depend on the Eucharist, help us go to the Eucharist for our faithfulness, to struggle against temptation. 
And it's beautiful to think of Mary receiving Holy Communion in those days. That whenever she received Jesus in that way, surely she must have thought back to all the other times she received him. Thought back to when she embraced him as a baby. Thought back to holding him as a child. But then also meeting him on his way to the cross. Taking his body down into her arms. Helping to bury him. But then also embracing him once more in the resurrection. This time tears of joy coming to her eyes. When Mary received her communion, surely these thoughts would have flashed through her mind. And Mary can teach us to embrace Jesus in that way as well. And embrace him and love him so we can be faithful until death. Be faithful against the snares of the enemy. So Mary, she is our mother too. She helps us to give thanks. Give thanks for everything. Give thanks with joy for everything in our life, especially for Jesus. She helps us to ask for big things and ask for faith. And she helps us to fight against temptation out of love for Jesus. Let's do what John did. We hear that John took her into his home. Let's take Mary into our home, into our hearts, into our personal lives, and she will help us to love Jesus, and especially in the Eucharist. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And next week we'll be looking at John and then Peter and Mary Magdalene to finish. There's lots of wonderful food. Thank you again to Grace and Constance uh, for, and Mary as well for putting on a wonderful spread. So please do uh, enjoy the food. Thank you.